The red light is on. Yeah, I struggle a bit with seeing it from here. Okay, <coughs> um, we continue. Um, distribution <coughs> strategies. Uh, <coughs> there are uh, basically three main uh, delivery strategies called A, B, and C here from local transit shipment point, from regional distribution centers, or directly from factory vendor. Now we are on the, on the distribution part of this. Uh, and uh, this table shows a uh, description of, uh, of uh, this, these shipments and the positive and negative uh, aspects of organizing uh, distribution in, in that way. Um, so we see that uh, from local transit shipment point, uh, you have short lead times, uh, direct, uh, direct trans transports, um, not many players in, the, in this distribution chain. Short lead time, but <coughs> uh, multiple inventory points may lead to duplication of stocks, and that is if you see it from, from um, <coughs> let's say, uh, a product that is taken in um, from another country, for instance, and taken in to, uh, to, to a market, a country, and, uh, and if you are distributing that product to uh, many places within that country, you are not able to uh, get a pattern where you have this, uh, where you can meet the variation in demand by, by holding a rather constant uh, amount of in inventory. So you duplicate, which you sort of avoid here <coughs> uh, because you can, you can merge the various demand patterns and and uh, and mask the differences by by uh, by compensating with uh, with uh, stocks that are kept in a in a distribution center. Um, <coughs> uh, so, with when it says less predictable demand lines, that is what I have shown over there: fluctuations, volatility. Um, Another <coughs> additional uh, topic here, or, or a sentence here, uh, that is that held at generic levels awaiting final configuration. That means that you can hold back and wait with the final labeling, the final assembly, in some cases, until the order is placed. An example of, of this kind of activities uh, is again uh, electric uh, equipment for domestic use. As far as I know, there are basically just a handful of, of makers of, uh, of microwave ovens. They are made according to some, uh, some spec. You have the box, the basics, and then when the order is placed, they brand it. They may put on uh, handles with a different shape and the labeling and so on. And then they ship it when the order is placed. And I mean, the order may not be just one item. It may be a container load full. But, uh, but the point is that uh, you, can, you can postpone the final production by organizing uh, the delivery strategy from, from uh, regional centers. And when regional here may mean uh, one within a country, or it may mean one or a few within a continent like Europe. And then you have the direct, <coughs> direct shipment from factory, um, which is more on, a, on an individual basis. It's hard to consolidate with other transport flows. Uh, but it may 
An example of, uh, of uh, this kind of production may also be uh, make to order or even engineering to order production. Where, uh, where perhaps the, the transportation part of the lead time is not significant. Because there are other parts of uh, other components in, the, in, the, in building up of lead time, like development, research, and so on, which may count uh, much more than, than setting up a streamlined distribution line for a tailor made product is, is not always uh, profitable. So long lead times, again, it says uh, it is a con, a negative factor. But then the next question one should ask then, is it a problem? And the answer may be no. I mean, other things equal, you would, you would of course prefer to have uh, perhaps a shorter lead time, but it may not be a problem. It may not be something that the customer is willing to pay much for to, to reduce the transport lead time. So that kind of questions needs to be, be, be asked um, in a critical assessment of how you set up the, the, the chains, uh, logistical cha chains. Um, challenges again, uh, extended lead time of supply due to heterogeneous markets that may have to do with different regimes, different cultures, uh, and so on. And uh, as I said, you can circumvent these problems by paying an insurance premium, by using a third party logistics provider, for instance. Uh, transit times extended due to the, let's say, the diversity in the, in the transport flows, where you have multiple breakpoints, you have multiple modes perhaps, and so on. And if you link this to what I said about risk, it's, uh, it's fully, fully relevant to do that. Sorry. Uh, so the point in putting up these these uh, these bullet points is that you can actually address these points by by breaking them down into units that can be measured. If you think in terms of research, you will say that cultural differences is something that you, you it's hard to to. Uh, quantify those in, in, in numerical terms, but you, you can use variables that, uh, that handles that in a, in a different way. Uh, the number of actors is easy to collect, different rules and customs need some, uh, some investigations, and it's not enough to just, of course, uh, report that there are differences you need also to try to quantify what the, uh, those differences means in terms of costs and, and, and lead times. Distances is, uh, is fairly simple, um, but um, if you translate distances and, uh, to transport time, it may become more difficult. Because transport time, may, um, it depends upon modes, it depends upon the use of modes, and it depends upon all the all the points, uh, the breakpoints that you may have along the way. Uh, <coughs> international logistics have, of course, a uh, greater demand and, uh, and a larger number of markets. And the larger number of markets means that you may uh, you you need to to address uh, market specific issues which uh, is done by the multinational players. Uh, the hamburger industry is one example that uh, is often mentioned as an example of adaptation to, to local market needs. S some of the larger hamburger chains in, uh, in that are present here in Norway, they are, for instance, using meat from Norwegian 
farmers. Not because it, is, uh, it has the lowest price or lowest costs, but because of market acceptability. If they didn't have to cope with such preferences, customers' preferences, they will probably have taken the meat from, from somewhere else. That's my guess. Great uncertainty goes together with a lot of the things that I mentioned and also the, the competence uh, that is needed to, to manage these, uh, these flows. Very simple in the illustration taken from, from the book again. It just says that when you have longer pipelines, uh, here a pipeline this consists of, uh, of a plant, a, a transit means uh, transportation from the plant to the distribution center, and then the transport again to the customer. And uh, this is an international chain with, where you have plant, transit, uh, forwarder, which is a shipper, and you have ocean transit, you have uh, the, receive, the, the shipper in the receiving country, the importing country, you have um, transport uh, again, and then the distribution center, and transport to the customer. So, if you think back to the, uh, to the very simple illustration that I made of the bullwhip effect, this is just saying that to hedge against, uh, let's say, a fear of stock out of products, because something may happen along these, uh, these logistical uh, chains, you need to keep some kind of safety stock. And then, there are, of course, a, a lot of, uh, of efforts that are done, made, to reduce the, the need for safety stock by streamlining uh, the various stages in these uh, chains. And there are also steps that are made to reduce the number of, uh, of, of links here in, an, in, in international uh, transport chains. I'll come back to that a bit. In the case, with the imports from, uh, from Norway to China. Yes, so this is uh, just to show you that what we are talking about here is uh, a very diversified picture of, of, of operations. It's a very diverse set of operations that are carried out when you talk about international logistics. And it's not always very fancy, you can see here. Sometimes it's, rather, it's really big, like uh, this, is a, this is a container port in, uh, in Asia somewhere. Whereas uh, this is a small uh, cargo vessel from, uh, from Norway, where taken from, uh, the picture taken from a Norwegian fjord, where, uh, where the volumes are small. Uh, if you compare a truckload, a full big uh, truck, uh, and you place that load in a, in a, in the compartment of a of a ship, it's almost not visible again, even in a small ship, because the capacity is so large. And when we are going to talk about in in uh, intermodal transportation, we are going to discuss the the various. Uh, characteristics of, of the transport modes and why it is uh, often difficult to transfer cargo from, uh, from, uh, from road to sea. And that is also a topic that, uh, that many of you have, have, uh, have an interest in, I have noticed from the, from the proposals that they have sent in. This the picture is, uh, is uh, you can call it empty repositioning. The pallets, this is perhaps uh, not too expensive to reposition, but if you talk about repositioning of containers, because you get a lot of cargo in, you empty them, you have a lot of uh, containers, and you are going to ship a rather small amount of cargo out from the same port. Then you have a lot of empty containers standing, idle, and you need to reposition them to, to some, somewhere else where they can be used. 
and that costs quite a lot. And such systems can be can be uh, can be optimized. So, uh, and this is uh, inventory holding, and this is inventory holding of uh, plastic chairs without any unit load. They are just stacked right onto the, the, the shop floor without any, any containerization at all. Which increased, is, which in, in many cases, especially if you have higher volumes, increases the, the unit cost of, of transportation. Now onto this uh, Norway-China case. Just a few <coughs> slides on, uh, on a very simple uh, description of this. Um, you see on the, on the, on the left-hand side, you have uh, a lot of suppliers feeding their uh, cargo in onto uh, Shanghai port, which is big. I've been there and it's, uh, it's impressive. And you have a, you have a container uh, vessel taking the, the cargo to, uh, well, this is simplified. It says to Oslo port. But there are no container ships going from Shanghai to Oslo port because they break the big container vessels in, in, uh, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And you have a, a small container feeder going from the Netherlands and to the Oslo port. So there is one link missing here. But that link is, uh, is equal for all the configurations, so so I decided to, to, to just skip it from for, for simplicity. And then the Oslo port may then ship out uh, the cargo to directly to the customers. So that is one possible configuration. I'm not saying that that is how it is done, but it's one possible conf configuration. Configuration two. Is a, <coughs> we have the same situation on the Chinese side, but uh, in Oslo we have a um, distribution center of Norway, DZN, which, um, which gathers the, the cargo from the Oslo port, consolidates it and ships it to the customers. When I say consolidate, <coughs> they can um, take in cargo from, from more than one ship, at the time, they can consolidate with uh, with uh, cargo that is uh, that has arrived by by truck or by by rail, and they uh, they merge all the cargo, the containers, uh, and ship it as uh, in as full loads as possible to the customers. So, <coughs> a customer here may be uh, it may be. Uh, a single company, or you can consider it as a, as a small Norwegian city, like Molde. There are not too many containers arriving here with, uh, with, uh, with uh, cargo, containerized cargo per, per, uh, per day. So it's not enough to fill a ship, but it, may, but it is it's probably enough to, to, uh, to, um, to fill a few trucks and, uh, and perhaps a train. Or, or a part of a train. And uh, those decisions about what kind of, of uh, transport mode that they're going to use is made by the, by the distribution center, which may be called a shipper or may be called a forward, forwarder. But the advantage <coughs> is that they are doing what they are good at, consolidating goods, they may, uh, they may uh, set up uh, a transportation network depending on the customer's needs. Some customers may want the cargo with a very, very short lead time. So then they just uh, <coughs> drive the cargo down to the Oslo main airport and then take it via air. Costs a lot, but maybe, uh, maybe a good thing based on customer's needs. Whereas others, other types of cargo may, be, may have a uh, uh, Tolerance for, for lead time so that they can, can consolidate and send it to, to a much lower cost for the customers. This is uh, the third configuration. 
which has gained some interest recently. Because here uh, we are consolidating in a, in a, in a distribution center in, uh, in China, which is uh, outside the Shanghai port, at, at least conceptually. Um, it's called a um, DCC, it might be a um, distribution center of China, but I would have called it um, the, the consolidation center, actually, of, uh, of China, because they take cargo in, they consolidate and, and ship off, but they ship it in uh, containers, directly to Norwegian customers. That may be a very good thing if the volumes are high. So certain big retailers of, uh, of uh, electronics, like you have heard about chains like Leftal and Elköp and uh, what, what have you in Norway. I'm not sure about the names in, in Germany or, or elsewhere. But they are so big <coughs> that they can uh, and and the, the value of the components are not always that high, so that they can can live with some uh, some lead time in terms of uh, of, of holding some invent inventory. Then they can take the containers directly to the customers. Just you label everything here. <coughs> you put on the correct address, and 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 off you go. But in, in other cases, where with, with lower volumes, that may not be, be the optimal strategy. And then you can end up with something like this, where um, you have the consolidation on the Chinese side, and you have um, consolidation also on the, on the Norwegian side, uh, with the benefits that I mentioned here full container loads, uh, filling of ships, a good thing if the demand is high, and not so good thing if the demand is low. And I refer to this credit crunch case that I, I talked about. But if the demand is high, the lead time is acceptably low when you consolidate to, to full ship loads. And, uh, and on this side, you, you have people here that can manage the transport side of the story according to, to the customer's needs on the, on the, on the right-hand side there. But as you might have seen from this, uh, this uh, picture, there is not necessarily one strategy that needs to be chosen here. As uh, the, the larger um, retailers of, uh, of electric equipment they can live with, sorry, they can live with this strategy, which they are about to, to test, actually, whether it, uh, it can be done in, in practice. Um, if you have high value, sorry, if you have high value, no, one further step back. If you have, va have high value commodities, that needs to be shipped right away as spare parts, for instance. You can do with a, with a direct flight with a very, very, um, without using all the distribution centers and, and, and stuff like that. You can also use this strategy if you have big loads like uh, uh, engineered to order products which are which may be uh, large like a crane or a ship or what have you and then you can uh, you can use a direct configuration but the most common is this one where where you have uh, a consolidator in uh, on both sides and uh, which are um, which are uh, trying to optimize the flows here uh, <coughs> what you might object 
to a system like that is that you, at least in early days, you lost control of what was actually going on. As a supplier, for instance, if you, if you shipped your product into this uh, center and then on to the customer, you, you actually lost, uh, lost track of where it was and how, lo how long it did take and the customers they called because they hadn't got the product in time and so on and so forth. All that kind of, uh, of hassle is now uh, reduced to a very large extent by means of tracking and tracing equipment. It's not perfect yet. There are still the challenges with, uh, with tracking and tracing, but it's, uh, it's improving quite fast. And that is important <coughs> because um, tracking and tracing means that you can plan. Also, as a customer, you can plan if you, if you see that, uh, for instance, a delay is, uh, has occurred or you can even be told that a delay is expected. You get an expected time of arrival, which may deviate from the planned time of arrival. But when you get that in time, <coughs> in many cases, you can, you can take steps to, to, to avoid problems. Again, back to the risk chapter. So what I have <laughs> talked about now is, um, is described on the next four slides. So I, I leave it to you to read them. You can have them as, uh, as support. You will get the slide and I will post them today. Because I was slow last week, I have to admit, by posting the slides. It took much longer time that I had, uh, than I had planned, but uh, anyway. So those four slides that I skipped now is, uh, is uh, more or less uh, discussed already. I just want to, to finish off this section of international logistics by talking a bit about localization and how you can address localization uh, issues and, and selecting where you are going to to, to, to uh, where you are going to source from, where you may locate your, your business. So <coughs> there are different phases in a, in a decision like that. Um, you may have a problem with your cost level. You may want to, uh, to, uh, to reduce sourcing costs by changing to other uh, suppliers. Uh, and you you have done a very thorough uh, analysis of possibilities. Sounds simple, but it's very hard. But it's a, it is a golden rule of every kind of uh, assessment of uh, changes that you should try to find and identify all relevant possibilities or options that you, can, uh, that you can actually undertake. It can be to produce in uh, Lithuania, Estonia, Germany, Czech Republic or wherever. And you need to collect information uh, on that. And, uh, and <coughs> to put it very simple, select the, the, the best solution. And what I'm talking, going to talk about is a very simple uh, analysis for, uh, for analyzing uh, the best location of an activity. Uh, you start with a kind of rough approach uh, where you try to limit the scope of possi possible locations to perhaps a continent, and within a continent, a limited number of countries, and, and so on. So you, you sort of narrow down the scope of the analysis to, to specific sites where you, can, uh, where you can locate. And when I say location, it may not be, a, let's say, a, a field where there is nothing from, from at the outset. It may be a location in terms of uh, 
entering into a partnership or in, even to uh, to merge with a with an existing company or to to uh, acquire an existing company like Rolls Royce did here in uh, in uh, in this region to so so location is not to build up necessarily something new but it may be to take over something somebody else's uh, so there are there are uh, four steps. Um, one is to take take into uh, to make a decision on whether you should uh, centralize in, in larger units or not. Then you can use some of the some of the concepts that I have been talk talking about. Whether you need to to, to level out uh, demand fluctuations whether you have scale effects in, in, uh, in concentrating, whether your uh, customers are very keen on short lead time, which means that you need to locate closer to them, perhaps, than, than, uh, than um, if the opposite is the case. Then, you have said something about uh, the this base or the number of options that you have for your, your analysis. And then you go on selecting location criteria. That may have to do with physical infrastructure. It may be whether you have access to an airport, access to a seaport, access to rail, motorway access, uh, whether you have qualified labor, in the area, whether you can have, have a, uh, a labor uh, a workforce that can uh, cope with, uh, with growth in your, in your uh, activities and so on. Land prices, accessibility and prices of raw materials and so on. Then, when you have listed the number of, uh, of factors, you can select weights on the different criteria. And then you, know, you of course weigh higher, higher the most important uh, item here. Like for instance, if physical in infrastructure is the most important, then you, you, you assign a higher weight. I'll show you how it is done. And then you, you, you by means of, of applying a what we call a multi-criteria analysis. You can, uh, you can uh, actually figure out uh, at least uh, a big, uh, let's say, you can figure out, or those criteria may be then a, a big part of the information that you need to make the decisions. So, you select criteria of relevance, which are these. You assign weights, weight to the different uh, criteria. And when I say attributes, that is the, the items that you, you assign scores to. I will show you uh, on the next slide. And then you, you rate each location with respect to their performance. Like an example here, where we have put up some criteria. Access to railways, access to waterways, roads, site availability, uh, central location. And that can be measured in terms of the number of kilometers to the to the nearest city with an airport, for, in, for instance. Skilled workforce, and you see that the weights here should sum, sum themselves up to 1.0. Or uh, normally we use one as as the as a sum. If you use 10 or 100, I mean you can uh, you can easily convert that, but uh, it, it it doesn't matter. The uh, road infrastructure is the most important part of, of the infrastructure uh, question here. 
And then you can uh, choose scores for each of these, these uh, criteria. And you have two regions. And you have scores between 1 and 5 here. So uh, a score of 5 is good, excellent. One score of 1 is poor. And you see the scores here for each region. See that region B is very strong on, uh, on road infrastructure. Um, and uh, weak on railways and waterways. That may be uh, very relevant and it's not uh, too uncommon that you have such, uh, such differences. And the, the, the clue now is to multiply the scores with the weights and you summarize vertically and you get a score which then has to be between 1 and 5. So this is a very simple uh, version of a multi-criteria analysis uh, used on, uh, on a localization problem like this. And you see that uh, in this case Region B, region B is, is, uh, is a bit better than region A. It's at a slightly higher score. And then you can, you can then compare these scores with economic calculations. Like if you, for instance, have now calculated different costs of, uh, of uh, establishing your company in, this, in, in, in these two areas. And if it costs slightly more to establish in, in region B, you can live with that if you believe that, uh, that the difference in, uh, in uh, accessibility and workforce uh, evaluation, if that difference can justify the extra costs. If <coughs> the costs of establishing yourself in region B is lower than in A. Then you should be on fairly safe ground if you choose region B. The problem is if you have kind of contradictory results, if the economic calculations, the cost minimization calculations favors the region with a lower score on these location criteria, you need to be careful and you need to address if, uh, if a difference of uh, 100 million uh, euros can be uh, uh, enough to offset the difference in, uh, in accessibility and, uh, and workforce quality. But there are many other criteria that can be used. These are only examples. And the weights are also examples. The important thing is that the weights are, sum uh, are summarized to 1.0. Because then your scores will end within the same scale as, you, uh, as the score scores that you give, give here. And uh, this kind of assessments are, are, uh, are very often made. And, and can be very useful when in, uh, in aiding uh, decisions. So, uh, so multi-criteria analysis is, uh, is, uh, is, is used in combination with, uh, with the economic calculations to, to make or to aid decision making like, like this. This is just uh, an example taken from the book of, uh, of uh, a physical infrastructure setup in, in Asia. And this is uh, just an example for one uh, major logistics provider when they have located their consolidation hubs for taking out products from China, China to, to the global market, located uh, here and in, in Shenzhen here, and uh, Fuzhou here, Shanghai. Four major uh, consolidation centers, 
and then they have some smaller uh, offices and smaller warehouses for taking in, let's say, the, the primary, uh, the first point where you consolidate goods and then you consolidate further into one of these bigger uh, consolidation hubs and then ship out. You have one here as well. But the decisions on where to locate these are based on, of course, there are a lot of history and what we call path dependency in this. I mean, there you have some big systems and it's very costly to, to uh, to build up capacity somewhere else, so we will normally uh, use the existing infrastructure where applicable. But of course, even big ports can get too big. And then you have the diseconomies of scale, when, when the system becomes so large that, uh, that the time costs, for instance, may, may become prohibitive. All right, summary. The world is moving towards more standardized products. So, uh, and that's a way of, uh, of uh, exploiting scale effects. And also, this, the batch size of, of sourcing increases to exploit economies of scale in, uh, in uh, I mean, there are rules for optimizing the uh, the economic uh, size of, uh, of uh, how much you should order at the same time. At the, at the same time. But, but this is a trend. More standardized products. And there is a counter, counter trend uh, with uh, local products, more diversity and so on. But in big, this is the picture. Fewer suppliers more concentrated relations, fewer players in this uh, global, uh, global market. Um, the supplier's costs and not the supplier's prices will become more important. And this is a statement that needs to be understood in light of increased integration between buyers and suppliers. So they share a lot of information about costs, and, uh, and the costs are a determinant of, of the prices that the suppliers can, can charge to the, to the buyers. Reduce number of layers for obvious reasons. I showed you this pipeline with all the, all the steps in, the, in, the, in a traditional international logistics chain. It's a good point to, to reduce that number. Um, a more reflected attitude regarding outsourcing and re-engineering of existing logistical processes. Not so much focus on offshoring as it used to be 10 years ago. Yeah, I've seen, said this already. Uh, information and communication technology has, uh, is playing an increasingly important role in, in, uh, in uh, managing the information flow between uh, buyers and suppliers. Um, and uh, we might have a case where you can see how, uh, how uh, information technology is used to, to, uh, to govern um, a logistical flow of cars which are released from the factory and uh, goes through a, a chain and, and, and up as at, at the customers. And how information technology is, uh, is used to manage that, that flow. More direct distribution, ref the China-Norway case, when you consolidate in China and ship directly. Uh, and this differentiation, which is a very important point so there are no, uh, no such thing as a one-size-fits-all in, uh, in this business. Yeah. Any interruptions? Okay. Then uh, I think it's three weeks until I meet you again. So have a good time. Meanwhile, thank you.